All right. So Dan Wall is one of a fifth generation of his family to live in the Houston area. He trained in regional geology. He enjoyed a career in petroleum exploration research and management. He holds a bachelor's degree from Rice University, a Master of Arts from the University of Wyoming, and a PhD from the University of Texas at Austin, all in geology. So he is Dr. Dan. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> he serves on the Harris County Historical Commission. He's worked on a project to bring historical markers to significant sites in western Harris County. In 2016, he published a history of the early settlers of the western part of Greater Houston entitled Pleasant Bend, Upper Buffalo Bayou and the San Felipe, uh, see I stumble, yeah well, anyway, San Felipe Trail in the 19th century. Curious about the world of the earliest residents of our area, he joined the Houston Archaeological Society and the Texas Archaeological Society and he began to research and compile records of hundreds of archaeological sites in our area. At the same time, he worked with coastal geologist John Anderson at Rice University and others to create a map record of the gradual inundation of our area by rising sea level since the last global glaciation. And he integrated all of this archaeological, geological, and historical information into a series of regional maps. His book, A Prehistory of Houston and Southeast Texas, Landscape and Culture, resulted from all that work. We are delighted to have him with us. It's an hour and a half drive down here, an hour and a half drive back, and an hour and a half here waiting for us to get ready for him. And so we are very pleased to have him give his presentation. OK, well, thank you very much, Pam. And I'm delighted to be here. Even with an hour and a half drive, it wasn't so bad. Um, uh, I grew up in Pearland, so I'm not far away. This is almost like old home to me to be driving around here because I remember a half a century ago in high school, uh, we used to play Hitchcock and Santa Fe and Lamarck, and uh, I do remember we used to beat Lamarck regularly, but <laughs> maybe I shouldn't say that. Anyway, uh, yeah, we're going to talk a little bit. I, I know y'all are all interested in, in the natural world, and one thing in, in Houston I've noticed that we don't do very well is understanding the prehistory of our area. Uh, I'm a member of a lot of different historical societies, and most of them think that uh, um, the history of the Astrodome really goes way back. And, you know, and, um, so uh, anyway, we'll talk about a little bit further back uh, the, this evening. And let's see. Yeah. OK, in this maps I'm going to show you, um, you'll see a blue star on there. That just shows where we are in the mark. And uh, uh, just so that you kind of, it's, it's very important, I'm sure you naturalists know, to get a f feeling or a sense of, of place. And so you always know where you are on these uh, various maps. And uh, yeah, this was, as Pam mentioned, I, I started this because there really wasn't anything. There are no reference books. Um, that really talk about prehistory of both the land and the cultures um, in any kind of a, of, a, of a compiled or you know general way. So that's what that uh, that's what that book is is all about. And that was about uh, four years research. I'm I'm retired like you. This is this is the stuff that I do for fun. Anyway. <clears throat> Here's uh, this area here, that what the red outline is, that's just an outline of southeast uh, Texas uh, that was uh, useful because a lot of the information that I was using was from the Houston Archaeological Society, and that's how they defined it. But anyway, what's yellow on there are the urban areas, and you can see that where we are in Lamarck is really just an extension of the, and as is Pearland, uh, of the greater Houston area. I live far to the west where the little fingers of, of Houston are, are getting out into Fort Bend County. Um, let's see. Okay, but now let's remove all the cities and all towns and all that and just talk about nature for a second. Now, I could show you a real de detailed landscape map with lots of different subdivisions, but let's just boil it down to, to three things. Um, up in East Texas, we've got the Piney Woods, and the, the hilly part of the Piney Woods to the north is called Piney Woods, and the flat part to the south is called the, uh, 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 not runaways, uh, what am I, 
big thicket, sorry. <laughs> Brain freeze. Anyway, but we'll just call it piney was now not shaded in, in, um, in uh, brown. Then shaded in yellow are floodplain forests. So if you think of the Colorado River, the Brazos, um, the San Jacinto, the Trinity, the Natchez, and the Sabine, all of them were cut in Pleistocene time and cut into broad valleys. And those valleys may be even up to 20 miles wide. And uh, those floodplains are a special environment, which back in the day um, were uh, all uh, forests. Um, and then what's not colored yellow or brown is prairie. Now, we can subdivide that further. It goes as you go to the south, where we are here, it ends up being coastal marshes. If you go to the north, it ends up being um, a prairie mixed in with uh, savanna, which is, for my money, that says just a, a prairie that has a few oak trees on it. So um, there are just the three types. Now, I mentioned to you before that uh, there's been a lot of change. If you go, if you go to the Colorado and Brazos today, drive through, say, around uh, Wharton or that area, um, you won't see this yellow floodplain forest. Uh, you'll see cotton fields. Uh, as far as the eye can see, there are, there are, most of those forests have all been destroyed. What happened, this was the first major ecosystem to go down uh, with the arrival of Europeans in, in Texas. And what happened was, um, uh, 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 Stephen F. Austin's colonists were here for one reason and one reason only, and that was to uh, put in uh, uh, cotton plantations. And to do that, they needed the best soil. Well, the best soil is in those floodplain, uh, in those floodplains that got flooded every year. Silt comes down, marvelous fertility uh, at a time when they didn't have any uh, any any fertilizer. So um, this is. Uh, this is a very fascinating picture, but it was painted in 1828 on Bernardo Plantation, just maybe 10 miles north of where I live. And um, it's, um, it, like I said, 1828. And you can see, of course, the cultural part's kind of painful to see. It's, you see a, a bunch of enslaved women there cultivating cotton under the stern gaze of an overseer. He's the guy with the, with the whip. But if you forget about the human part of this for a second and look at the landscape behind them, what you see is a whole landscape of dead and dying trees. What they did, they had to come in, they brought their slaves with them, and they had to make money quick. So what they did was to girdle the trees. So the entire forest was, was killed very, very quickly. Um, so anyway. Uh, that's what happened to that forest, but for the time, the way we're going to be talking about it tonight, the time before 1700, um, consider them uh, virgin forests with gigantic big trees. Um, okay, so let's talk about the people who were there at the time of, of Spanish arrivals. Really, the Spanish didn't make, even though Cabeza de Vaca was here in the 1500s, he passed through, but the only significant Spanish interaction came in the mid-1700s when the Spanish were uh, going up against the French who were coming west from Louisiana and uh, the Mississippi and uh, you know they were they were jousting for control of Texas but anyway um, at 1700 in the area to the uh, to the uh, including here um, was was the Atacapa southwest Louisiana and um, um, uh, southeasternmost Texas. In the area around the San, this is the San Jacinto River and the Trinity, uh, and going into Galveston Bay was Akokisa, band of the Atakapa. Then the north, further to the north along the Trinity were the Bidai. The uh, Atakapa proper band was uh, along the Neches and the Sabine. And then along the Calcasieu River and the Mermentola River and the Vermilion were three different other bands. They all spoke the same language, but they were divided up in, by river drainages. And uh, we don't have a lot of pictures of those guys uh, from the day. Uh, this, in fact, is the only one. And this was drawn in 1735 in New Orleans. This uh, man came to uh, trade uh, uh, deer skins and uh, uh, bear skins and bear oil to the uh, bear tallow 
uh, to the Spanish. They had a big fur trade going on at the time. And you can see he has a, a tan tonsured hairdo up here, um, shaved on the, on the scalp, uh, kind of like a medieval monk. And then a, a stripe, a, a, a tattooed stripe coming down his nose. And uh, he's wearing, a, of course, a breech cloth. And um, he's carrying a pipe, a clay pipe in his left hand. They were big tobacco smokers. And then in his right is a calumet, which is kind of like a ceremonial pipe. Anyway, that's, that's our best view of what one of these, look, these folks uh, uh, look like. We'll talk more about what happened to him in a minute. And here's one in, in uh, uh, winter dress with a beautiful robe on, which that's more likely a buffalo robe. And uh, you can see that um, his, uh, his wife um, spent a lot of time uh, making beautiful patterns on the underside, the flesh side of the, of the thing. Anyway, oh, and look at the tail coming out the back. That's really cool. Very nice fashion accessory. <clears throat> then uh, to the east of, uh, to the, sorry, to the west of us, further down the coast, starting in the Colorado and Brazos Rivers were the Caranqua. And the easternmost band, the one we'll talk about most tonight, are the Coco, who were the, this band that were in the lower Brazos and uh, Colorado Rivers, river valleys, um, living along the coast and then moving uh, inward. This, we actually have a picture of these folks. Um, this is uh, uh, one of the men, S pretty much the same dress as the Akokisa, uh, a different way of addressing their hair, uh, different tattoos. Um, they had uh, circle tattoos under the, on their high cheekbones. But anyway, they were, they were big at fish um, and very expert at fishing with spears and bows and arrows. They used uh, log canoes, very much like the Seminole, and uh, they were all over these bays in here um, uh, fishing. And they'd go interior for other things later on in the year. Okay, and then it, further inland, uh, the Plains tribes, uh, Tonkawa up in here, and then in East Texas, the Caddo, who I'm sure you've heard about. So, <clears throat> why uh, in our history books don't we talk about them? If you go to any of the schools around here, you'll find that they talk almost nothing about these, these people. And it's because very few Texans had any kind of interaction with them. Um, if we, we talk about the Atakapa, uh, what happened there was really quite tragic. But um, when the Spanish came in, they brought in missionaries, Franciscan missionaries. And at the time, it wasn't like back in the 16th century when they were enslaving Indians and all that. They actually were trying to help these Indians who were begging for help because they're getting whipped on by the, the Lipan Apaches and the Comanches. And um, so they built uh, some three uh, missions up near uh, Rock, Rockland, Texas, um, San Xavier, Candelaria, and Ildefonso. And then one down here on the bottom of the Trinity in an awful swamp called Orco Quisac, which is the Spanish way of saying Acoquisa. And uh, anyway, that was fine. Um, the Indians wel welcomed that and went to go there. Uh, and, um, but then what happened was um, just, just horrible. And the Spanish kept really good records, so we know how many waves of, of, um, of disease swept through these people with every kind of European disease that you can imagine. Just one smallpox disease in 1748 with the bee dye uh, killed half of their tribe or the half of their band just like that. And they just went waves and waves of each of these. So it was really bad. And you can see it, the Spanish were very good at counting uh, how many Indians there were. And the reason was is that the friar, the good friars, um, um, their, their report card was how many souls they saved. Well, you had to count them, right? So uh, they, they counted them. They, they didn't get, actually they didn't get many converts, but they knew how many Indians were out there. And you can see these are the Akokisia, uh, Bida, and Takama. And you can see here's the, in blue, is when the mission, the mission era took place. And you just see that just absolutely precipitous decline. So that by the time Austin's colony got started, which is in brown here, um, there was almost nobody left. So with the Akokisia, uh, there were, just two or three shredded little small bands left as, as the colonists came in, and they were just pushed, basically pushed aside and ignored, and later for, forcibly removed to Oklahoma. 
So uh, that's why nobody, you know, when you talk about Sam Houston coming in in 1836 and all that, there's very, very little in early Houston history about these tribes. Much more about the Alabama Cushata who were who came, were forced in from uh, the southeastern U.S. They, they're not native to our area. The Karakoa, the Karakoa is a little bit different story. Um, they put up a resistance. And um, if you take a look again, here's Austin's colony in the capital, San Philippi. And here's this map again, showing you uh, what Austin did was he sold that land. And by 1824, that's what the map looked like. And there were thousands of people, both uh, Anglo people and, and uh, enslaved African Americans, living on land that had been the Cocos' prime breadbasket. They lived on those rivers, and no attention was given to where they would go, so they were forced out. And they didn't go without a fight, and there was a, just a really bloody part of, of early Texas history um, with massacres on both sides. They'd massacre settlers, then the settlers would gang up and mass massacre three times as many of them. Finally, they were forced out, and they, they were forced all the way down into Mexico along with the rest of the Caranqua. And uh, they couldn't live there because all the land was taken, and it was not nearly as rich as our land up in here. So they tried to come back, and, and uh, in the 1850s, uh, I think the remnants were pretty much uh, killed off, except for a few that, that um, were adopted by, or rather really enslaved by, some of the early Texas colonists. Um, and they became servants. But that was, as far as the culture and the language, that was, uh, that was the end of the line. Anyway, now uh, let's leave that period of time, which is just 400 years ago, behind and dig a little bit deeper now into archaeologic time. And here we're just at the, at the young, youngest most period of that called the late prehistoric, early historic. So anywhere from 1400 to 400 years ago. And what these dots are, are um, places that the Houston Archaeological Society and several other archaeological studies have studied. And the red dots are what they call soil middens. And what you can think of there is an old trash heap. And they, they usually you know, rest maybe a foot or two high above the rest of the landscape. And a trained archaeologist will see these things. And in there, there will be um, uh, uh, old uh, shells and bones, uh, um, old fire middens and, and stuff like that that they can study and get an idea. So that's the red ones. But as you get close to this coast, like around here, you'll notice that it gives way to blue dots, which are coastal shell middens. So instead of it being trash mixed with soil, it's big heaps of, of shells. And all the bays around here used to have these, these big shell middens around. Here's one you can still see some of these in the um, in the area around the Trinity River uh, estuary, there's hundreds of them over there. And if you excavate one of these like this fellow did, he's, he's looking at about eight or 10 feet of, of, uh, of a shell, most of which, there's some oyster, but most of which is it's called Rangia cuneata. And you've all seen these shells, you picked them up on the beach. Now they tend to grow, they like brackish water. They don't like the open ocean and they don't like fresh water. So they, they like the rivers and creeks that are within about 12 miles of the coast. And so that's, I've drawn a line around that. That's the brackish water limit. And uh, inland of that, it's, it's all soil middens, but seaward of that, it's mostly, it's mostly these. Now, if you think about it, don't think that uh, these guys were sitting around all day eat, doing nothing else but eat, eating oysters, because you know, it was actually a relatively small part of their diet. If you think, you know, when you go to Guido's or somewhere and have a big um, meal and you, you have a big uh, uh, feast of, of oysters, you and, and your wife and your friends and whatever, at the end of the evening, you might have quite a heap of oyster shells. And they were the same way, of course, even though uh, that might have been only hors d'oeuvres. Um, and if you have a, a catfish, maybe even a catfish this big, a 50-pounder, um, all that's left in the archaeological re record of that are the eardrum called otoliths, which are tiny little things about the size of a pin. And that's what they have. So if you find a lot of otoliths, that's worth about a foot of that midden right there. So, you know, um, they, they ate a lot of stuff. They ate turtles. They ate alligators. They ate a lot of fish. 
uh, and then some shellfish. Okay, that's the coastal zone. What, what I'm trying to do is lay out there's three main life ways, ways you could make a living in this southeastern Texas area. The second way is back to these big river floodplains. And if you notice, in particular, the Trinity River, see all the sites lining it? Same here, fewer Houston archaeologists went out there. That's why there's fewer sites, because uh, it's further away from Houston. But, and then there's some here along the Brazos. Okay, so that's a different, that's a different way of making a living. And uh, here's just an artist's recreation of it from, from my book. But basically, they had, uh, they had dug out canoes. And they ate a lot of fish, a lot of turtles, a lot of alligators. The alligators, by the way, wasn't just for the meat or for the skins, but also for the fat. They boiled that fat down and used that as a, both a suntan lotion and a mosquito lotion. And uh, it was apparently pretty effective, except it, it didn't have a very pleasant smell. But um, also, you can see this woman making pottery here late in time. They, they made pots. Um, you can see they had rounded huts of sticks tied together and then uh, buffalo hides over the, uh, over the top. And uh, that's pretty much it. Now we know even back in prehistory they were doing that. These are some woodworking tools. These are the chip ends of the bit of an ass that they would use for carving out these, these canoes. And um, there, there's records, early, early uh, visitors to Texas uh, saw this uh, pretty much in action. And then you'll see things like this old bone all here, which is about, I don't know, six or eight inches long. And that's what this woman over here is using to sew the skins onto the hide. You can just put some sinew on there and, and go to town. Anyway, uh, then the third uh, major, major way of living is prairie hunting. And if you look to the east of, to the north of us, we're, we're here, and you look up in here in the Katy and the Grimes and the San Bernard Prairie, you see clusters, dense clusters of archeological sites on tiny little small creeks in the middle of the prairie. And you're thinking, what on God's earth are they doing out there in the middle of the prairie? Because uh, there's, you know, maybe a few trees, well there are, there's a forest cover around each one of those small creeks and bayous, but, uh, um, why such a preponderance? Um, well, it's, it's fairly easy when you dig into it. The, um, they were, these are buffalo hunting sites. They were hunting bison and also deer on the prairie. And um, anywhere in the Great Plains, you know, you probably have seen these pictures of uh, up in Montana where, you know, they're driving a, a, a bunch of buffalo over a 200-foot cliff, which kills them, and that's great. But um, out here we have uh, creeks, but they have pretty steep banks too. Uh, most of the creeks around our area before the, you know, before the flood control measures were probably anywhere from, from six to 40 feet. And uh, that's quite a drop. If you force some uh, mice and over and, and running from a, a, fo a fire that you set, uh, when they drop off that thing, they're gonna be disoriented for just a little bit. And it's that just a little bit you need because you don't have a, a horse and you don't have a bow and arrow. You've got an atlatl, which is like a throwing stick. So you have to get relatively close, uh, at least with certainly within 100 yards or better. And uh, you need them to slow down a bit. And the creeks is where they would slow down and maybe even have to swim across, which would even slow them down even more. So that's why all those sites are there. Um, we're going to talk about this in much more detail in just a second in that square area around Katy and San Bernard. But first, before we do that, um, you're probably wondering, what does that have to do with us? Because we're here in Lamarck, and we're in the coastal zone. Well, what I want to show you is that uh, the coastal zone came to Lamarck pretty recently. Um, this is a, a sea level curve for the Gulf Coast. Starting, uh, this is year, uh, year zero, that's today going back 10,000 years and 20,000 years ago. And this is sea level. Uh, where it is today, sea level is zero by definition. And back when, 20,000 years ago, as you can see, it was 125 meters. That's about 400 feet deeper, lower than it is today. Why? Because this was the, the, uh, the last ice age. That was the peak of the last glaciation 22,000 years ago. And um, now, obviously, we didn't have ice here. The weather was maybe 
six or seven degrees cooler than it is today. And since that time, the weather has warmed. And as it has warmed globally, that global climate warming has caused the ice stocks along the poles to, to uh, melt. And that raises the sea level to where it is. And you can see there, that at first it was rising pretty fast. And then later on, it slows down. Well, let me show you now, just reconstruct what the situation looked like. So again, here's where we are now. And here is about 150 miles or so further out is where the coastline was at that time. And where the, where the brackish water limit, where you might find, if you're looking for 20,000-year-old um, middens, this is where you'd have to go to look. Um, now, think about it. You're here I, in Lamarck and Hitchcock or any of these places. On a, if the traffic isn't too bad, you're within 15 minutes of getting a fresh seafood dinner. But uh, now you're about four hours away from, from seafood. You're kind of like San Antonio or something. <laughs> so the point is, is that it was an upland prairie. And uh, let's, fill the, let's fill the bathtub back in. This is 14,000 years ago, 12,500 years ago. Notice what's happening here. I'm going to drop back one. Notice here that the, um, see, is this thing? Uh, I think I've run out of battery on that. Um, this is the Trinity in San, in San Jacinto River. That's the, the Natchez and the uh, Sabine. And notice that they're all on the same trunk line. It all came together at the same place. Anyway, as, as it, it, it's, a, it's an incised canyon uh, because the sea level was low, and that canyon uh, then fills in with water, and it starts to make a bay. This is the beginnings of Galveston Bay, but you can see we're a long way from where Galveston is going to be. And then it uh, continues to flood with, uh, now we're up to about here. I'll mention something about these hardy natives that were back then. That sea level, uh, today we, we worry about sea level coming up three millimeters a year, more, more as things warm up. And uh, we're really frightened by it. Back then it was 40 millimeters a year. Um, but they didn't build holiday houses on the surf zone, so they didn't have to worry about it. Anyway, um, so let's continue. Here you can see it's starting to break up, and, and now what used to be uh, connected rivers are now a series of open bays out into the Gulf. You can see just the beginnings of flooding into Galveston Bay. This is 9,000 years ago. Then uh, 5,000 years ago, it starts to look pretty much like it is today. In fact, now we're starting to see the first, um, the first uh, 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 shell middens are of, the, are of that age. One of them is not very far from here at, uh, at Clear Lake, on the north shore of Clear Lake. And then, um, yeah, now we're back to 1400. Um, this is basically uh, today. And um, anyway, so you can see that, that um, what is now a coastal zone is not always that way. And the, that whatever brackish water plants you see along the riverways weren't here even 5,000 years ago. Uh, but all the upland prairie plants certainly were. Um, okay, uh, yeah, yeah, just highlighting the point, that's a, that's a lot of coastal incursion. And it's not over, folks. Um, we still have a little bit more rise uh, to, to go. Okay, um, now, one thing about these uh, natives that were hunting is that they did it seasonally. So these guys that were on the coast eating shellfish in the warm months during the fall of the year, they would come into the prairies and hunt. The Alcoquisac went into the Katy Prairie. The Coco went into the San Bernard, but also into the Katy. Uh, the Abidi, they went from their Trinity River haunts into the Grimes. And then people all the way from, from Austin, San Antonio, the Tonkawa, uh, came and, and hunted in these same areas. It was a very, very rich hunting area in the fall. Why the fall? Because in the fall, um, in the fall of the year, Bison started, now I'm, draw, I'm just going to go into that black area there. Okay, here we are. Let me just get you situated real quick. Here's Houston, downtown Houston. Here's Sealy, Rosenberg. Everybody know where they are? Spring. This is the Brazos River and the Colorado River. This is kind of how we look at things, we, we being we Europeans. 
Um, this is what the land, light, land map looked like within 50 years of Austin's colony. Every little bit had been boxed in and fixed, fenced in. And the way we tend to think of things, we think of this box here is my box and that box is your box. And inside my box, I have to make a living inside the box. That's not the way they were doing it. Uh, this is what they saw. Let me get rid of the cities now. And uh, they saw forests and they saw prairies. And they saw these creeks coming across the prairie and you notice, take a look here. This is Upper Buffalo Bayou here. That's White Oak Bayou, or the upper part of West Bernard Creek. Do you see? They're like fingers that are sticking up, up into the uh, up into the uh, northwest part of the prairie. Well, uh, during the fall of the year, um, bison would be coming down from the north. Why? As freezes start to happen in North Texas, that freezes all the green grass. So they kind of keep moving south of the freeze line to keep getting good grass. And that gradually forces them further south and further south. Ultimately, they want to be in Lamarck. Those that survive would get down here. Um, OK. Now, so if you think about it, um, where would be the good place to hunt? You've got a prairie animal. He likes to be in the prairie. He doesn't want to be in the forest. Bad things happen in the forest. So they'll stay away from the, uh, the, the, the big thicket up in here, Piney Woods, and they'll stay out of these big, massive floodplains because those are all mighty trees and whatever, and they don't want to be there. So they'll come down this way. There's one corridor heading through here and another corridor through here. But it's kind of like a big pinball machine. If they come through here and somebody gets behind and chases them, like with a fire or something, they could instead of going this way, they might get caught in one of these cul-de-sacs. And they'd get forced into that cul-de-sac, and it narrows down and narrows down. And finally, you know, there's trees on either side, so they don't, they don't get out. They just keep following it to the east until finally they have to jump. And guess what? That's where the Indians are waiting. OK, so it's quite obvious it's not a random occurrence where archaeological sites are. Those sites are where they had their abattoirs. This was, um, this was like a, so here's the, here's the drill. They were being driven into these various cul-de-sacs, funnel cul-de-sacs by, by, by hunters. And um, yeah, that's, uh, so one thing Europeans, again, we, we tend to think of this is my box kind of thinking. And they could not recognize what they were seeing, which was a massive, massive um, uh, bison ranching scheme. They ranched. They ranched bison in the prairies, and those are the places where they, they harvested them. Okay, some of the places, famous places, if you, if you like archaeology and want to dig into the literature, I've summarized them in my book, but along White Oak Bayou, um, uh, oops, sorry, along White Oak Bayou, uh, there's a number of sites where there were gullies coming into the bayou, and they were just their people. They were running into the gullies, and then they were getting rained on by by uh, um, hunters with with atlatls, and they basically slaughtered the animal, and then uh, cut the flesh off the bones in place, and took just the flesh and the skins back to back to camp. Uh, same thing in the upper bayou. This is the area around. Um, um, this area here is the area around. Uh, Attics and, and Barker Reservoir, if you know that area. That used to be a famous place in the 1920s and 30s and 40s to hunt uh, arrowheads because it was just so rich in, in debris from all of those uh, hunting trips. And then down here, um, yeah, on the San Bernard River, there's another one of these, that a big cul-de-sac. I'm going to show you a little bit more of that in a second. But I want, to think, want you to think, too, about time now and a time scale. And this is an archaeological time scale, and the circle tells you how old it is. Early Paleo, early Paleo Indian takes you back 13,500 years. Middle Archaic, about 6,000 years. Late Prehistoric is 1,400 years ago to maybe 400 years ago. So you're looking at about 13, almost 14,000 years of history here. And you can see that many of these places look along White Oak Bayou. It's kind of hard to see the red sticking out. But these things have been continually, continually hunted for thousands and thousands of years. We've been here for 200. 
Um, and uh, they used them over and over again. Why? Because it was a perfect place to kill buffalo. That's why. Um, let's, I want to show you one area here just to give you a, a sense on the ground. This is down uh, just northeast. Wharton would be about here. This is just northeast of, of Wharton. And if you look at uh, just below off of the archaeological map without the ages on it, um, you can see that you're in kind of one of these cul-de-sacs, and there's a ring of, of sites, uh, archaeological sites around that. This is what it looks like. This was during Hurricane Harvey. And uh, it was a good time to use a picture because uh, the water had made all the forested areas and formerly forested areas uh, black because a lot of the farmers cut down those forests. But that's what the forest pattern would have looked like. So um, this is, you know, they would have been running. They'd have been on the run. The bison would uh, be coming down here. And once they get into this cul-de-sac or that cul-de-sac, then uh, they have to make a decision and jump. Now, on this particular area around B, each one of these little points that are sticking out is a sandy knoll that rests about 50 feet above the creek. Um, I'm going to show you one of them, which is Site 19, very famous uh, archaeological site. Um, this is the high prairie here. It's flat, 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 flat. They're on the run. Then they have to jump. And that's about a 40, 50 foot drop. I've climbed on that. It's very hard. Um, I, I stumbled several times. It's very steep. And uh, you would have seen them doing that too. That Yopan wouldn't have been there. That would have been burnt off at the time. Now, the, where were the Indians? They were on the other side of the river over here. And I'm, I'm losing it again. Yeah. Um, but they'd have been on the other side of the river, raining, raining hell down on those poor, uh, those poor bison. This is drawn pretty much to scale what it looked like. The archaeological site is just around the corner where they had their campsite, where they'd bring the meat and process the meat. Um, if you look at archaeological sites, we're the ones that have bison bones, and you can pretty much see the corridor we've been talking about. There's two corridors where they would drive them to the sea, and you can see they came all the way into this area. In fact, if you read, um, LaSalle uh, had a lieutenant named Jotel that uh, wrote a, a really nice uh, biography of their time in, in, uh, um, uh, uh, in uh, sorry, thanks. They're over, they're over here, but um, show, talking about the bison that would come down the coast, and almost every day in the fall, they could uh, get some bison to eat. OK, so, um, but not so much over here. Uh, why? Well, bison aren't going to go running around in piney woods, I can tell you that. So um, yeah, now, uh-oh, um, yeah, it's not, it's not working. I'll, I'll just use this arrow here. Um, yeah. Oh, did I? OK. Anyway, the other thing you find at those sites are, are knives. And uh, lots of knives. I'll talk about one of those again. Now, if you stop back and look at a picture of all of Texas, you know, from, uh, from the space shuttle, um, this is a satellite image that's just showing uh, in green uh, forest cover. And you can see that you've got piney woods to the east, central Texas forest to the in, in west. In between was the great Texas plains. And, which is prairie and savanna. And the bison would be coming down into this area and then finally taking a kind of a left turn into the, into the coast. Um, thank you. Uh, yeah. So uh, let's consider what was going on here. Um, and I want to introduce the idea to you of refugia. Um, it's an archaeological term, but it has a real cultural meaning. If, you, you're, most of you that were around here in 2011 probably remember that big drought that we had. Uh, this thing we had this year is nothing compared to 2011. Well, those things were very common in prehistory. Remember, over the thousands and thousands of years, some of those droughts didn't last just one year. Some of them lasted 10. Some of them lasted over 100 years. Now, if you're in that situation and you've got your family to feed, what are you going to do? Where are you going to go? And uh, one thing you're not going to do is stay out here, because unless you have wells and irrigation, uh, this is just sun-baked desert those, for those extended drought times. So you have to go somewhere where there's going to be food and, and shelter and water. Well, this is the Balcones Escarpment of Texas, uh, right along here, drawn in purple. And uh, one set of people would go up there. Why? 
We have all those springs, you know, San Marcos and all those things. Those springs keep flowing. And because of that, you've got deer, you've got turtle, you've got alligators, uh, and you have fish. And so uh, one refu refuge, a refugium, would be to go into there. And a whole group of people over thousands of years did just that. They developed their own kind of, of uh, spear points, uh, or dark points, I should say. And uh, they, they were along there, along those creeks and rivers. And when times were good and there was rain, the bison would come down. The bison never came down during a drought. There was nothing for them to eat that stay in the Midwest. But anyway, they could come down and they could uh, 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 go out into the prairie then and hunt. And so you find these arrowheads, these, arrow, I keep saying arrowheads, they're dark points, atlatl points. You find those, do, 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 those points scattered all over here in, in, in uh, um, bison uh, hunting sites. Now, off in East Texas was another group of people I'll call the Trinity Sabine tradition. Same thing. They stayed, uh, their, their, their refugium was the river valleys of the, um, in the forested rivers of the Trinity, the San Jacinto, and uh, the Neches and Sabine. Why? Well, those rivers are also partly spring-fed, and they would have water in them, and of course you'd live then on the same thing, fish, turtles, alligators. Uh, and that sort of thing, until things got a little bit uh, better. And when things got better, who doesn't like a steak dinner? They would go out and hunt the same areas. Then in the south, coming up from Mexico, um, it was a little bit more challenging an environment coming out of that hot Texas brush country. But uh, uh, some of the bigger rivers, like the San Antonio River, would bring fresh water into those bays. and. Uh, so you could live off that fresh water and then live off of shellfish and, and uh, marine fish um, and while, while all that dry time is, is occurring. And they had their own types of, of points. Anyway, just trying to get, in a nutshell, that's Texas archaeology is those three main cultural groups. Interesting thing is that this little box we've been talking about is one place where all three hunted. And you could imagine that they didn't always love each other. Um, now, I want to mention one more thing about prairies, because you guys are interested in prairies, I'm sure. Um, and, uh, you know, when the early guys uh, in the 1820s started coming into the area, they wrote about it as if, my goodness, this is the Garden of Eden. Completely untouched. They didn't see any Indians just untouched big big prairies and and forests and teeming with wild flower wild wild life and blah 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 and they also noticed of course that that uh, there were frequent uh, prairie fires well um the, the question is was it really a garden of eden or as i just mentioned to you was it actually a big bison ranch well i think part of the answer if you look at what happened in in barker and attic's reservoirs over the last 60 years. When, when the, those reservoirs were built in the 1840s, sorry, 1640, 1940s, oh my gosh. Anyway, there's the residue reservoir. That was ranch land. They, they, they forced out the ranchers, and you can see the creeks. In fact, there's one of those bison traps right there. Lots of arrowheads. Come down here, lots of arrowheads. OK, so, so um, that's, that's what it was. And now, once you. Once you fence all that off and you don't allow mowing anymore and you don't allow grazing anymore, what's going to happen? In our humid climate, that immediately turns to forest. So if you go to those areas today, those reservoirs, I don't know if you've been there lately, but um, it's basically a forest. So within 50 years, it reverted to forest. That kind of tells you that th in our humid area, anyway, say east of, um, I don't know, east of, of, of uh, what's halfway to San Antonio, um, Columbus, or whatever. It's so humid that uh, trees are going to take over. I passed some uh, patches of, of uh, land on the way in tonight and noticed they were, you know, places where somebody didn't want to sell and they just kept it, but they didn't keep it up or whatever. And it's all forested. Same thing. So um, we needed that. The, the prairies that we have are, in, in, in a real strong sense, their legacy of the, of the Native Americans that were here before us. It was not a Garden of Eden. It was a managed landscape. OK. Um, 
Now, let's talk a little bit about culture. And again, let's think, I want to point out a, a people here that lived here about 2,500 years ago in the area that was later to be occupied by the cocoa. And this is just the bison. You know, they're on one of these big bison corridors. And uh, yeah, it's what I call the, the late archaic, which means about 1200 BC to 400 AD, time of Christ, plus or minus some hundreds of years. Um, and it was some, what we call a lower Brazos culture or lower Brazos mortuary culture because they had a lot of cemeteries. And one of them is just a stone's throw from where I live, a place called Bowser Mound. This is what it looks like. It's uh, not much to write home about um, topographically. It's about 10 feet high, about the size of a football field. Uh, but that is the earliest constructed, man-constructed item in our whole region um, that was built as a, as a burial mound. Um, yeah, so what's inside that? It was uh, about 25 years ago it was excavated, and uh, these are some of the treasures that came out of it. Uh, this is a, p a pendant necklace here made out of Bisicon, which is lightning milk, which you find on the, the, the beach, of course, today. And these gorgets are also made out of lightning whelk. And these beads, columella beads, that's the central column of, of one. So um, that's the lightning whelk. And these things, um, you don't see the other whelks. It's always this one. And not only here, but as I'll show you in a minute, going all the way up into the Great Lakes. It was always busy con perversum, um, which means, perverse means it turns to the left. And you'll notice that the, 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 uh, the blue diagram there showing you that it turns from the, if you're looking from above, it turns counterclockwise. Every single other species of Bisicon turns to the right. The Indians knew this, and to them that was sacred. And a way that, you know, um, it sets you apart that you identify with this shell because it travels a different route and you, you know, you're, your ethic code or whatever is that you also do. And uh, so it was widespread with North American Indians. Anyway, um, they would make these uh, uh, shell ornaments out of it by taking panels off. This is, this is uh, one that had been half, uh, half uh, processed that was found in the cemetery. And they'd take these panels off like that or gorgets off the little round part here. And then the central column would become the the ornaments, and it was uh, like a little manufacturing item that was going on here along the Brazos and, and lower Colorado. Some of the other things that were in there, um, you know, pretty standard points, uh, some bone items, uh, some fish, even this is 60, 60 or miles or so inland, uh, some shark's teeth. Uh, they're telling you that these were people coming up from the coast, which we knew. Then some really interesting stuff. These are what are called boat stones, associated with pebbles, made out of sandstone that's not from around here. And um, uh, they were found around some of the bodies, typically upside down, inverted upside down onto the body with the pebbles underneath. And uh, there's been a lot of theories about what they are. But uh, some of these, as I'll show you in a second, some of these rocks came all the way from the, from the uh, Washita Mountains up in uh, Arkansas and Oklahoma. And uh, then there are these things called corner tang knives. This is about, uh, that's about the size of my hand, maybe six, seven inches across. The tang is the little thing up there which probably was used to, um, to tie it on to you while you're traversing the prairies. You don't uh, leave it behind. And uh, that particular one is made out of uh, a shirt that came from the, San, the, the uh, Balcones Escarpment. So, you know, think San Marcos, Austin area. And um, yeah, and then most fascinating of all, this copper awl. Um, it's made out of copper that was rolled into a sheet. Um, and I'll show you in a minute they, where they come from, um, where this one came from was Lake Superior. Um, about 2,000 miles uh, away. It's been geochemically uh, fingerprinted and whatever, and all the others are like that as well. Um, okay, so 
now let's start to look at the situation here. And again, we're down here, there's, there's our star. Um, there was a cultural boundary here. The red circles are these cemeteries that this people had. And there was what, there's maybe 10 or 12 of these cemeteries along the rivers, typically along the rims. And um, you'll notice that some of them have these little lightning bolts. Those are ones where some of the bodies showed evidence of a violent death. I'll talk more about it in a minute. The white circles are showing places where there are marine shell ornaments that I've been talking about. And the marine shell ornaments were also found in places where there weren't cemeteries. These are places where in the fall they were, uh, had little workshops uh, making these ornaments. Okay, then just on the other side of the, the Brazos drainage, uh, off into the San Jacinto drainage, um, there were no cemeteries. Uh, there were no uh, marine shell ornaments. But one thing they had that these guys didn't was pottery. Pottery was working its way in at this time, about the time of Christ, uh, into, the, uh, into the southeast Texas area, what they call Chifuncta ware. And uh, it was there, the pottery had reached here by 70 BC and here by AD 100. These guys had never seen any of it. So this, is, uh, this cultural boundary here uh, existed when Cabeza de Vaca landed. You know, he, he landed on Follett's, uh, it's Follett's Peninsula or Follett's Island down here. And uh, he noted in his journal that there were two Indian tribes, one on one side of the island and the other on the other. And he was talking about basically the Akokisa and the Coco. These guys, I forgot to mention, but they have the same, these guys from 2,000 years ago had pretty much the same area as, mo as modern, uh, modern Coco. Okay, um, yeah, so here's the question. Uh, who were these guys? Um, because no one in Texas had been doing things like burying grave goods, exotic grave goods from 1,000 miles away. Uh, that hadn't been done before. So where were they from? Did they drop out of the sky, or what's the deal? So if you look at the violent deaths and see, for example, here, this poor guy got three uh, uh, spear points. Um, that were uh, Pontchartrain here. These green ones are all from the Trinity, San, uh, Trinity Sabine tradition, the guys up in East Texas. And the red ones are from uh, Plains tribes that were coming from Austin and, and that area. So uh, this group was getting hit upon by both of these. And what we don't see any of is, uh, is of the, um, the Central Coast South Texas tradition which fits because later the Central Coast South tradition became the Karankwa and the Coco were a band of the Karankwa. We're probably looking at people who are the ancestors of the Coco Karankwa. Um, yeah, no, a little bit on the mound itself and where it ties in with North American culture. Um, these, uh, this is, it's kind of an interesting story that it's, Pool Hill is an old glacial remnant and uh, I live somewhere <laughs> down here, the, the things are dimming again on me, but um, Bowser Mound is sitting out there and it's completely separate from the topography. Why? Because it was a built, it was a built up mound. But if you look to the northwest of it where it's in blue there, there's a slough there that later on a, fa a, a farmer drained, but it was kind of a swampy slough forever. The interesting thing about these is uh, these sloughs and mounds is that whenever you go into Mississippi, Louisiana, any of these mound cultures, if you see a mound like this one here, um, it's typically not too far away will be a slough. If you think about it, they didn't have iron shovels. They were using probably the scapula of uh, buffalo, right, uh, to dig with. They wanted something that was kind of, kind of wet soil. And so if there was a swampy area, they'd start digging there and they'd make that swampy area bigger and deeper and it would get swampier and swampier. And that's what they call a, a burrow pit. And uh, here's another one. This is uh, Marsden Mounds in North Louisiana. These are fascinating places to go, but you can see it, then you can see that. Anyway, uh, these, these mounds, uh, mound culture, is something that is not certain. This is a rare thing where we are, but it's very, very common as you go to the Ohio River Valley, which is over uh, here. I'll show you a map in a second. So this would be the Washita area up in Arkansas, Oklahoma, a little bit in Texas. 
And then here's our lower Brazos culture here. Um, what's in, in green here, the things that are shaded green were cultures that build, uh, built uh, burial mounds. And um, yeah, so here it was the late lower Brazos. In this area, it was the Fush Malin, who were the people before the Caddo. And then here was the uh, um, Glacial Cames, Adena, and Hopewell peoples, who uh, there was a big significant hiatus here and a long time before finally mound building came back in the Ohio River Valley here. There was also a hiatus here. And here, we had it up this mound culture till about this point here, and then there was a, a hiatus, and they never did any more cemetery burials. Um, so uh, let's take a look at the ones to the northeast. This is the glacial came culture. It's around the great eastern Great Lakes. Um, what glacial cames are, are um, uh, basically sand masses that are left by the retreating glaciers. And these people who were living around those areas, uh, they started to, to use them for burial grounds because it was easy to dig into the sand. But not only did they bury people there, but they started putting in interesting objects um, like uh, copper, uh, like shells, uh, marine shells, and uh, uh, boat stones and things like this. Anyway, um, as time went on, a few hundred years later, they moved into the Ohio River Valley, and that was called the Adena culture. Also had some mounds. They had some, actually some quite sizable ones, but most of them were the size of this one here, about the size of a Bowser mound. It was a built burial mound. And then finally, the Hopewell people uh, from about AD 100 to around oh, 350 or 400 um, also had, again, burial mounds. Um, and we're starting to build larger uh, platform mounds at that time. Anyway, so there, there are the different cultures. Now, if we go down from the Ohio Valley down to our area, uh, also mound builders, the black squares are, are the mounds in our part of the world, are the, uh, of this age, late archaic, uh, would be Fourche Moline. There's some in the lower Mississippi Valley. And down here, our lonely little Bowser Mound. Um, yeah, so let's think about the items that are in these. And I'll start with the, um, the, uh, the, the corner tang knife here. What's the story with it? Do you remember this is that outline of where they found buff bison bones in the archaeological sites down here? Well, this, is the, uh, uh, this shows you where all the, the um, uh, corner tank knives have been found. And where you can see is that where the bison were in the Great Plains, that's where you find these things. They were bison skinning knives. And uh, they were utilitarian. How do you know that? Well, um, if they were, had any kind of religious significance or whatever, these cultures over here, these mound building cultures, would have tapped into that and traded them, but they didn't trade them. This was just something, it was like a screwdriver or a, an ax or something that was used. Uh, in fact, most of the ones that have been found have been found out in the field where they were busy doing stuff as opposed to in campsites. Anyway, so, uh, and they came from, the, most of them were, there we go, uh, along the San Marcus Escarpment, uh, sorry, Balcones Escarpment. Why? Because rich chert outcrops there. And uh, so they made them there and then moved, huh, well, anyway, moved up into the Great Plains or traded them up to the north. Now, more in, much more interesting and completely different map is these marine shell ornaments, the Bisicon. And uh, what's in orange are places where they're found. These are whole counties down here of distribution, but here it's individual archaeological sites. And you can see that these are found all the way up into the Great Lakes. Why, why is that interesting? Well, these things are, these are marine gastropods, they don't live in rivers. So these ones that were here had to come from somewhere, so they came from the ocean. Did they come from Florida? Did they come from Texas? What's the story? Well, this is where uh, Bisicon are found, lightning whelks, and you can see all the way up to the Georgia coast, but that's it. That's it. Um, so that doesn't really help. But one thing that does help, if you go through all the other archaeological cultures of this era, uh, in uh, the area to the east, they used Bisicon to make um, little choppers and uh, uh, bladed tools and stuff like that, but no pendants, no uh, gorgets, uh, no beads made out of Bisicon. Only place that came from was right here in Texas. So, um, 
Yeah, and the other thing, of course, is for making ornaments uh, like this, um, these are the sites that we know of where those were being made. So you quickly get the feeling that they were making them here and they were trading them up the, up the river. And uh, that would have happened probably uh, along trails here because you're cutting across small rivers. Um, this would be the Camino Real and some others I'll talk about in a second. And then getting into the river systems where it would have traveled by canoe. Um, that's uh, about a 2,000 to 2,500 mile uh, journey. And it goes down into Mexico too, by the way. Okay, just to show you, give you an idea of how similar they are, let's just compare it from three different areas here. And uh, these on the left, this is from Bowser Mound. These are gorgets and, and pendants. These are ones from Michigan. These are ones from glacial came sites in Ontario. As you can see, there's not a dime's worth of difference between them. Uh, they were used up and all the way up into um, uh, modern times. These are all photographs of Native Americans. And you'll notice this guy here with the, the uh, gorget here. You can see why the holes were in these archaeological ones. That was to tie them onto the uh, stuff. These are, these are basically, you can be thinking of them as religious ornaments very much. And that's about a 2,000 year old uh, um, uh, heritage of, of uh, using them as religious ornaments. If you think about that, those of you that have maybe crosses of David or, or crucifixes, you know, on your neck chains or whatever, you're doing the same thing. And it also is about 2,000 years old. Um, Okay, then the copper. <laughs> yeah, here's the only place that Native Americans could get copper was up here in the Keweenaw Peninsula and Cape Royale, East Isle Royale uh, up in Lake Superior. Um, this is all chemically, done, chemically studied by all these. Anyway, the green stars are where they're finding them in all of these sites alongside the, the, the shells and then all the way down into Texas and the southwesternmost one is that all I showed you. And this, that all in the Bowser site looks like ones that are up there, up in Ontario, and these that are up in Michigan. Um, not much difference between them. What this is, what we're trying to put together here is a story that really our, our area was tied in with the greater Eastern Woodlands area as one cultural, one vast cultural area. Not the same tribe, not the same culture, but very similar religious beliefs. And when we talk about religious beliefs, and probably the most interesting of them in all is the boat stones. These are the ones from the Bowser site that I mentioned. And these are other ones that are along the Brazos River, the Witte site, Albert George site, not very far really from here to the west, and the Jonas Short sites in East Texas. Um, these are a particular rock type that's very fascinating called Nephilim cyanide. I'm a geologist, I promise you not to, not to bore you on this, but the thing that's interesting about these Nephilim cyanide ones is in all of North America, at least Eastern North America, there's only one place you can get Nephilim cyanide, and that's up just around Hot Springs area to the east of the Washita Mountains, right there. There's four plugs, each about the size of this room. That's it. So when you see those things in the, subs, in the uh, in archeological sites, coming down in here and down and all the way down into here, one thing you can say with 100% certainty is that that boat stone came from right there. So you know the dispersal routes. They, uh, the pink, by the way, is the places where they're finding boat stones, and the dark pink is where there were great concentrations of them. And you can see that it was a culture, it was a, so, so a, a religious item that was coming out of, or a ritual item that was coming out of the Washita's, both the rock and the idea, idea of the item itself. Uh, here's the same map, just blown up a little bit bigger, and you also see these things up into the Ohio Valley and, and whatever. And I, I'll just show you a few of these to give you an idea of how similar they are um, from those four areas. Bingo, okay. So here's the Bowser site. This is the Ozon site in the Washita's of southwestern Arkansas. This is Jonas Mound. These are in the Ohio uh, River Valley um, and uh, around uh, uh, Lake, uh, Lake, I guess that's Lake Erie. Anyway, uh, same thing with these gravel ideas. So what's the deal with the gravel? Um, by the way, that one's made out of copper um, rather than stone, which is kind of in, unusual. All right, let's get an idea of what that was all about. This is a, a, a 
particularly prominent grave that was excavated of an adult male about 500 BC. And uh, you can see this is where that beautiful necklace came from, was around his neck. And there are also some columella beads, which are there if you can just make them out in green there. And then uh, around also coming off of his neck, and down around his pelvis area were a lot of uh, bone items that are in there in brown. And then finally, in blue, uh, um, are these three boat stones, as I mentioned, upside down over pebbles and over a lot of red ochre uh, uh, spread around. Um, now, the interesting thing about this drawing, uh, one of these volunteer archaeologists like you and me uh, drew this picture, 25 years ago. Look at his right arm. His right arm is just where you expect it to be, lying by his side. Look at his left arm. His left arm is grasping the area over his pelvis where these boat stones and bone items are. So what that kind of tells you is that that was uh, his, his medicine bag or sacred pouch. These uh, Bezikon necklaces like this, there's only a couple of them. They're, they're really very, very rare. He was a man of some stature and uh, was most likely carrying a, 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 a sacred bundle. And uh, that's how, why his, he was grasping it with his hand. Now, as far as the gravel goes, these pea-sized gravel, if you go on, just a few hundred years later in the Mississippian period, they used to take gravel like that and put it in turtle shells and then close off the openings, put the gravel inside, drill a hole so you could put it on a stick, and that became a rattle. You can see with these boat stones that most likely this, the gravel would be in here and you'd put some rawhide over the front and you would have a rattle. Um, even into modern times, the Creek Indians were using these tortoise shells as rattles and they would tie these around women's legs. So as they're doing their dance and they're doing their stomping, it was making this rattling sound. They've actually started to replace that today if you go to modern powwows with uh, tin cans basically tied around legs. Anyway, so that's most likely what these were about. But think of religious, cultural significance was pretty much it. Now, um, how, did the, how did this distribution scheme work? Well, starting around Cape Girardeau, Missouri, I'm probably butchering the pronunciation. That's where the, the Ohio and the Mississippi come together. And right there, there was a very prominent Indian trail called the Natchitoches Trail uh, that took off. And it was uh, quite an old trail by the time the col early colonists got there. And then it goes right through the Sinai area. How convenient. And then connects with Trammell Trace and then into El Camino Real, which was when the Spanish came into Texas, they didn't build those roads. They were already there as Native American roads. So you can see kind of the, the idea of, uh, and those roads, by the way, went into central Mexico. Um, yeah, so here are all three, the, you know, the copper, the busy con, the boat stones put together. And what it's defining then is, is a distribution route that's going from the Great Lakes down, into, down to, to, to Mexico. And the interesting thing about it is that um, around the year 1000, corn made it up into the Ohio River Valley. It didn't appear overnight. It was domesticated down in Mexico. It probably came along this route. And then down in Mexico, these pyramids um, that were built the predecessors, the pyramid predecessors of them that were uh, up to a couple thousand years older were from the Ohio, Ohio and Upper Mississippi uh, River Valleys. They were the older ones. So arguably the idea for making a squared off pyramid like that came from these North American cultures and went down the trail in the opposite direction. So this is younger than the period of time we're talking about, but showing you that some of these routes lasted for a long time. Now, here's the deal. At that time, most Indian tribes, as you know, were at war with each other, almost continually. So how do you, uh, a young uh, Coco, uh, Paleo Coco, uh, get all the way up to Lake Superior to get this all you've had your eye on in the Sears Roebuck catalog? <laughs> You're not going to make it alive. And so it's always a problem. Well, how did this distribution work? And of course, with us being Europeans, all we can think of is, 
I place an order, I pay you money, you deliver that thing to me. That's how the Wells Fargo wagon works. But with them, um, it was something a little bit different. Uh, there was a woman named Laura Block, wrote a beautiful um, dissertation just a few years ago. She spent some time with the Creek Indians in the, along the Alabama Georgia border and um, listened to a lot of their tales and wrote them down. And one of their mythic tales was of people that lived in the sky along the Milky Way, which they called the Great White Road. And uh, it, there were all sorts of little clusters of stars, which were, which were settlements. And uh, people were always at warfare, and they had a, a group up in the, there was a celestial guy, for, it's called Hakuliet, I think it's, I'm butchering that pronunciation, that would go along and, and make peace between people. Well, the interesting thing is that they also had uh, the, the uh, earthbound uh, version of that, who were called the Esnissa. And these were um, people who were trader diplomats, quasi-religious. Um, they dressed in white. Uh, these are, by the way, Aztec equivalents, same thing, dressing in white. They had, uh, according to Creek culture and also Aztec culture, they carried a staff with various uh, feathers on it that denoted who they were and where they were from. And then they carried a basket on their back, which uh, included uh, uh, gifts, um, sacred gifts. They traveled on these earthly, what they call white roads, free from attack. Nobody would dare attack an Isnissa. They were acolytes of sacred knowledge. They were revered. And they were also peacemakers. Let me tell you how that works. So here's tribe A over here. And uh, it hates tribe B over here. Constant warfare. Why? The Isnissa goes and he asks the tribe A, why do you hate tribe B? Well, because uh, 30 years or 20 years ago, they came and raided us killed a bunch of people, stole a bunch of our young girls, and they kidnapped them, and they took them back. And they said, well, that's not so good. So, he, so the Isnissa goes over to tribe B and says, uh, looks around and said, well, whatever happened to those girls that you uh, kidnapped? And by this time, they were all women that had married into prominent positions in the tribe that had been very well honored and treated. And so he takes this information back to Tribe A and said, you know, um, it was actually a pretty good thing for these. They've treated these girls really well, and they're married in with chiefs and all this sort of stuff. So, uh, so Tribe A says, oh, that's great. Well, let's go and let's go make peace and, and have a party, which they did. And of course, to have a party, you needed to carry gifts. Well, the Aznissa said, not a problem. I've got the sacred gifts with me. And what did he carry in his bag? Shells, sacred shells, copper, which they considered part of the sun that had fallen to the earth, uh, green stone, volcanic stones that, that were revered, uh, sheets of mica, yopon leaves they used to make black. Anyway, the point is, is that these same things that we see throughout the woodland cultures going down to the Bowser Mound are, in essence, just that. Um, uh, so the distribution center was you use a, uh, a guy, these, by the way, the, uh, the Aztec equivalents, they could go anywhere in Mesoamerica and never be attacked, no matter the tribe. And this is all written down by the, the Aztecs in the years after the Spanish conquest. So it was a very efficient system, and it meant you could go, you had a, a way to move things over long distances. And it was all religious in, or, in, in uh, origin. Okay, um, now, <laughs> I, I showed you that gap on the, on the time scale. I said, you know, right around 400, they stopped burying people in Bowser Mountain, and that was the end of it. No more burial goods, no more long distance trade. The same thing was happening in, uh, in Hopewell. Hopewell is a famous time where archeologists see all this vibrant culture building mounds and burying all kinds of rich goods that had come long distances into these mounds, and all of a sudden, nothing. Well, earlier this year, uh, just as fate would have it, uh, some group of, of, of uh, people up in the uh, University of Cincinnati did some looking at the soils around the archaeological sites in, um, in the Hopewell area, trying to get, address this problem. And what did they see but um, a, a debris plume here with things like microspherules of silica, iron silica, which come from meteor collisions or comets. 
and high amounts of platinum and iridium in the soil and widespread charcoal areas over a very large area, suggesting that there was a kind of like a fireball and it burned a lot of forests. And so they were thinking at the time, they were thinking that it was a, probably a comet impact because there was no crater. But later on, I think they've changed the story a little bit um, and it, that it was an ex a meteorite that exploded over the area, but the impact was the same. If this thing, thing rain, rained down on your culture and uh, you were a strong people like the, and, and religious people like the Hopewell were, well, if the, if the heavens rain down on you and wipe you out, it kind of gives you a feeling like maybe you've got the wrong kind of approach to life or something. And I think, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting idea that, that down here in, uh, in uh, Arkansas and Texas where, again, the same thing happened. Huh. I'm frozen solid. Huh. Oh, well. Anyway. It's the last slide anyway. The, 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 the point is, is, uh, is that uh, that would shut off the, the whole Isnissa trade route as well. So anyway, that's kind of a story of how our area kicks. But you, you can see that there's a lot to our prehistory, um, a lot in terms of the development of the landscape, but also that you know the people that here were not simple-minded people sitting around uh, trying to catch the next rabbit that they actually were cultured people doing very interesting things. Um, as far as the Bowser Mound goes, um, I noticed, of course, a lot, most of you are master naturalists. I've got several master naturalists working with us up in Fulcher, and we're trying to set, save that mound from turning into more houses and Burger King parking lots and uh, save it as a, as a heritage park where we intend to put prairie grass over it and save it as a as a monument, and the master naturalists up there hopefully will be involved in that. So anyway, thank you very much. I've really been finding this. Any questions? All right, questions. Anybody have a question in the room? We have plenty from the Zoom group. Raise your hand, and I'll hand you the microphone. Questions? Joe. I recently went to an exhibit in Dallas of items taken from the uh, mound that's there over there in eastern Oklahoma near Arkansas, and uh, they talked about the, the, the burial goods and the, the things, and there was no mention in the exhibit of this Hopewell meteor. At least I overlooked it. It's brand new. Yeah. That only came out in Science Magazine. It's not finished science. There's people pushing back against it. It's the same thing happened with the, the Cretaceous meteorite impact. It, it takes about 10 years for these new ideas to settle out. They have to go and take each objection and go back and do some sampling and let it, everything settle out. So who knows 10 years from now what the up theory will be look like. But they've kind of laid out the gauntlet, and now people, scientists are following up on it. So do we want to do a Zoom one, Mike? Uh, do we have any more in the room? Okay. Cool. So you showed their dwellings uh, that were covered in uh, hides. How, how do we know that with confidence? Sure. The Spanish and French. Okay. Yeah. And they there, they, uh, they described them in quite some detail. And that was the only known way that they covered their structures? Or is well, that... um, if you were in an area further to the east towards Beaumont, um, where there weren't so many bison, they would use you know, palmetto leaves, things like that, um, to, to cover them. But where they could, the best thing by far was bison hide. There was one more in the room. I thought I saw somebody else's hand. If not, oh, Steny. OK. Um, hold on. Hold on. Wait for the mic. I recently read an article about mounds that are on the LSU campus, and they were just beginning to uh, study them, and I was appalled. <laughs> do, do you know, have you heard anything about those? Uh, I, I've heard that they're studying them now, but 
the, in South Louisiana, I mean, they have a rich tradition of archaeology there. And all, all along the coast, there's hundreds, and going up to the lower Mississippi, hundreds of these mounds that have been studied pretty well. There's so many that some of them haven't, you know, been looked at. And probably a place like LSU, you know, it's uh, close to a lot of buildings, and they didn't want studies, and now they're getting around to it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Ryan Duran, uh, if you can unmute yourself and ask your question, you can, I can't do that. Um, I, I, Ryan does not have a mic, so you're going to have to read his questions. Read it. Uh, I can if you would like me to. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Verba, go ahead. Verba. Okay. Um, Question, the, his first question has to do with how much time we're talking about in terms of those uh, shell middens, the eight to 10 feet of shell middens. How long uh, did it take to, I, I'm not sure if he's talking about excavation of the eight to 10 feet or the creation of the eight to 10 feet, how long it took for that to happen. Yeah, those are the uh, studies I've seen, that was from the Trinity River estuary and there are literally hundreds of those. And um, the studies I've seen show that, you know, maybe uh, they might only be a few seasons uh, at, at one place and then they'll move to another. And because uh, the waters would be shifting and, and, you know, you'd kill off all the, all the, uh, uh, the, um, the clams in one place and have, to, and have to move. The other thing that we're doing kind of interesting is when you see those middens is the upper surface tends to be a pavement. In other words, they put them sharp side down and made a pavement so they were living on top of these, uh, these mounds. Oh, my goodness. Um, okay, Deborah and Mark Carter have a question and then Ryan has some more that I'll read. So Deborah and Mark, can you unmute yourself and ask your question, please? Um, your early uh, slide caught my eye. 20,000 years ago, how many miles would it have been from the red line out to the coast with the, with the Gulf of Mexico being 400 feet low? Yeah, if you take a look at a bathymetric map of the, you know, where the continental, the edge of the continental shelf is today, that's, that's where it was. And that's about, a, from Galveston, about 150 miles, uh, a little bit more, maybe. Thank you. Mm -hmm. right. that, that, none of that area, by the way, has been looked at archaeologically because it's underwater. Um, so. Another question from Ryan was, uh, he was impressed that you, there were uh, items made out of copper. This was earlier in your presentation. He said, exceptionally rare to his understanding for tools of that nature. And are there other examples of throwing sticks being made of other materials, such as hard woods? And wondered if copper throwing stick belonged to someone of exceptional status among the kin kin uh, kinsmen. Oh, that copper, um, I, I should mention that these burial mounds, there's only maybe 100, 120 people buried in the Bowser Mound, for example, but they were up there for a long time, thousands of years. So only people of, from the looks of it to me, only people of high status made it into those mounds. Um, uh, just do the numbers, do the math. Um, let's see, but you asked another question. I'm sorry, I've lost it. Um, Talking about the, if there were other materials, if there were uh, examples of throwing sticks from other materials. Yeah, yeah, uh, they often would would uh, fish and spearfish with uh, bone tipped uh, projectiles uh, in the water, and uh, or or even wood tipped because you know to make a wood tipped arrow to spear fish is fairly easy, and if you miss, uh, the arrow floats. So um, they, they, were, they were using that. Um, not a lot of obsidian down here. Uh, I think I can only think of one piece that made it down here because that's a long way and not in an area that they traded into New Mexico. Um, no, most of the arrow points um, uh, from this area, uh, what you'll find are things that are mostly made out of gravels from the Trinity uh, in, in San Jacinto. Um, gravels, tertiary gravels, or 
uh, from um, Chert from, from Central Texas. Uh, let's see, one is almost the last question from, from him right now. It's um, he wonders if there's any significance or pattern to the quantity of associated smaller pebbles within the boat stones. Um, not that I can tell of. I, I've showed you all the ones that are there. They're about the size of small peas, um, you know, and uh, fairly mostly quartz uh, and uniform size. So it wasn't like they just grabbed a handful of gravel. It had to be a certain size, uh, and that goes all the way up into all the way up into Ohio. Um, pea-sized gravel was a thing, and then later these. Turtle tortoise gravel, uh, turtle tortoise rattles used the same size, so there must be a must be an optimum size for making noise. Shall we take one more question? Um, this is his last question. He is wondering if the red okra pigment had some sort of seguin uh, evokes death passing meaning to them. Oh, now that I don't I, I don't know, but I do know that they. Uh, used red ochre a lot, uh, red ochre and then black carbon to paint their faces. Uh, that picture that I showed you, the Akokis uh, in uh, New Orleans in 1735, if I showed you the rest of the picture, there's a whole bunch of them in there that were all painted up with red ochre. And uh, the red ochre, by the way, came from uh, just about three counties in, northwest of Houston, where it starts to get hilly, uh, there's um, Miocene uh, hematite layers there. You know, you, when you're driving around East Texas and you see that red, kind of that real red dirt road, well, that's hematite. And a lot of it's nodular. And they would take, they would go and collect that stuff and bring it down to the coast and trade it. And um, anyway, then grind that up for red ochre. Okay. okay. Turning it back over to the room. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. That was uh, fabulous. Uh, your geologist was showing there right at the end, you know. <laughs> so one of the things you, that you might find interesting is the lightning whelk that you talk so much about. That's actually our pin for the Master Naturalist this year. We pick something new every year, and this year it's the light, lightning whelk. So that seems to be appropriate. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>